Brilliant. So thanks again, Baba, Saul, Nikki, everybody else um, involved, and, and, and good morning and welcome to everybody taking part in this year's airport. It's, um, I mean, usually one says it's nice to see you and meet you, but um, I just heard some of those introductions and it's all terribly artificial and, and um, sorry for that, but let's try and make it um, as, as lively as we can. What Nicola and I are going to try to do this morning is, as the title says, very introductory in a way. We're going to kind of touch on some themes, some background issues that we think are um, relevant to and will be explored in greater depth in a number of other sessions throughout uh, Apport. And in a way, what we want to do is to stimulate some thinking and discussion on your part by emphasizing some, um, perhaps some sort of key differences between, um, now I can't even move between, oh, okay, uh, some key differences between approaches and theories of economic development more broadly, but also of, um, of industrial policy in, in particular. So in order to do that, we're going to discuss very, very briefly, shockingly briefly, um, some very long run economic history to raise some questions about, you know, when we talk about economic development, what, what is it? What's the thing we're trying to make sense of and explain in a global historical context? And also what, what, what stories, what histories do different theories tell about that? That's quite an important issue to get into. We're going to run through some of the absolutely core issues in orthodox neoclassical uh, economics and development economics. And then we're going to highlight some particularly important features of at least one uh, kind of critical, different, or heterodox or alternative perspective on economic development. So if our aim overall is um, as policy uh, officials, as advisors or researchers working on policy relevant issues in economic development and structural change and poverty reduction and employment and so on, then our fundamental question has to be, you know, how? How do we do that? How has that been promoted historically? What's different now and what might not be in different parts of the world and so on? And we have when we probe that kind of question, we have these tensions, I think, um, in, in our minds. And one of them is a sort of contrast between a very powerful, very influential theory, set of theories, that predicts that there should be global convergence in living standards, incomes per capita, across the whole world. And that convergence should happen, so those theories say, almost automatically, so long as you allow the wonderful institutions that are markets to, um, to work their, their, their magic or, or their rationality or whatever it may be that they work. And there's a tension between that strong prediction that if you get your policies right, you'll almost automatically get that global convergence. And on the other hand, what we observe, what we all know to be the case, which is a staggering, profound divergence historically between living standards globally, between countries, but also, of course, within countries themselves. OK, so there we are. So we have that first big tension in our minds. No, go back, please. Thank you. And then another tension is that at least some of the evidence suggests to us, and always has since, in a way, the work of the pioneering uh, economist, economic historian Alexander Gershenkron, there are what they call latecomer advantages. You do not have to reinvent the wheel. So it seems to be possible for some latecomer industrializing capitalist economies to go through some of the process much faster. But clearly, we know this very obviously from, from, from looking at whether it's many, most countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, or it's Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia, those latecomer advantages seem to come on stream very unevenly. 
and not automatically. So how, how do we take it, but just saying there are advantages to starting the process later and catching up and not having to go through the same process as say England doesn't necessarily make it easier. So um, there's a tension there. There's a big tension throughout different approaches to the challenges, questions of economic development in the way in which people think about this as a learning process. And to be crude, you could contrast, for example, one approach, which, to, which is to say, look, just repeat after me. I know how economic development works. I've got a model that tells me all you need to do really is follow, uh, follow my lead. Uh, and, and a different version of that nowadays might be to say, well, look, we, we, we know there's a model out there and it's China. We all want to be China. Well, maybe we all want to be China, maybe we don't. Um, so uh, let's just copy and paste the China model in Ethiopia or Burkina Faso or Cuba or whatever. So that's one kind of approach to learning. But there's a very different approach to learning, which is a more selective, to be rather Chinese, it's a feeling for stones as you cross the river kind of approach. And it's more pragmatic, it's more selective. Um, Meles Zanawi, the late prime minister of Ethiopia, had his own way of characterizing this. He said, I call it the Sinatra method. He said, what I do is we, you know, we look around the world and, and we look at lots of very different experiences and policy approaches, and we pick and choose what we think might be most appropriate in the current historical conditions and structural constraints within Ethiopia. So I'll call it the Sinatra method because I did it my way, he did it his way, um, which appears to be unraveling right now in Ethiopia, but, but that's another story. So we need to, to bear in mind when, that given that industrial policy is itself a matter of learning and involves a kind of learning process, that there are different ways of conceiving learning. Thanks, Nicola, if you can move. Pass on. Okay, it's a good time right now to think about these different approaches, given that it seems that many um, of the great and the good, many, many very sensible voices uh, internationally, think that the economic profession and economic theory is in turmoil. There's increasing recognition in recent years, it's actually quite a lot of years, and particularly maybe going back to the, the global financial crisis in 2007 and eight, uh, that economics hasn't really quite got the answers it thought it had. So there's a, a sort of loss of confidence. And I've just given you here some, some article headlines from, from the Financial Times. You get these um, sage, voices like uh, Martin Wolf saying, well, Milton Friedman, who I'm sure Martin Wolf probably thought was quite right for a long time, says, look, he was completely wrong about the theory of the corporation and how it begins. The very excellent Martin Sandu saying, look, there's a revolution underway in macroeconomics. Uh, and people saying, we, we've, we've rubbished Keynes for, for, for decades. And actually, people are turning again and again to Keynesian approaches. So. There's, a, there's an opportunity, if you like, in a way, to, to have a more grown up, slightly less um, uh, divisive conversation about uh, the, the need to, to correct, to change, um, and to develop economic theories. And again, that's part of the background we're going to push on with. Nicola, if you can kind of move us on now. So in that light, I wanted to talk for a bit about um, the long historical backdrop, partly because it's very related to these, um, these differences in economic theory uh, and, and stories about how things work. So it, one way of thinking about this is to imagine, if you look at the blue bars, this per capita GDP, they're going to inevitably be slightly rough um, judgments about the level of GDP, but you should see the broad story happening here, which is that up until around you know, the late 1700s, early 1800s, 
there's really not much change globally, global GDP per capita. But after that, there is this thing called the Industrial Revolution. It pretty much happens first in England, and then it spreads to some extent internationally. And living standards, GDP per capita, take off. There is a sustained process of growth, of technical innovation, of spread effects, and of, of changes in living standards, which is really, really, that is the story of modern economic growth, but that's only the beginning of the story. So you see the, 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 the um, GDP levels in the, in the orange line and the GDP per capita in the blue bars. But clearly that rather lovely story doesn't apply neatly to everyone. So we need to move on to the next slide. And we need to see, well, at, there was, at the heart of that, there was what people call, and there's some debate about this, but let's do it for now anyway, called the great divergence. So up until the late 18th, early 19th century, the Industrial Revolution gets underway in England, and we can argue about when exactly. But up until then, India and China combined supplied about half the value of global output in the world. But by the 1950s, that had shrunk to 10% of the global economy, slightly less even. That's very, very stri striking, staggering differences globally opened up. There's an argument that, for example, before the Industrial Revolution, things weren't really that different, say, in China from what they were in, say, this tiny little island in northwest Europe called England, for UK, including England. Um, but then after the Industrial Revolution, there's this massive change in global power and economic uh, production and, and innovation and so on. And yet again, later on, post-World War II, that begins to shift again. And there is this broadly speaking development era that we, we all talk about. Next one, Nicola, if you can. Um, and one way of capturing the spread effects of development post-World War II is just to look there at the change in car production globally. And you see that in, in 1950, just after the, uh, um, the Second World War, around the time of the Korean War, the huge bulk of, of, of autos were, were built in the USA. And then over time, you got to a period where that shrank and Japan took over a major industrial share of the production of, of, of autos. Even the Japanese share has since the 90s shrunk quite a lot. And you get this extraordinary diversification. You get cars produced, yes, still in the USA and Japan, but also in Germany and in China and in a range of other countries, uh, in India and so on. So there's, that's one way of conceiving um, the, the catching up, the latecomer advantage story, if you like. And if we carry on, we'll look at it slightly more formally in how this process of catching up has been distributed thus far. Now, this is a bit tricky, but what you're looking at here is um, these lines are showing you the ratio. So we, we, what, what's the, the ratio between GDP per capita in developing countries and GDP per capita in the OECD, the Advanced Rich Industrialized Economies? So what's the, the sort of gap, if you like? And, and what you see is that uh, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and on the left, you see most parts of the world, um, their income per capita relative to that in the, uh, the first industrializers is shrinking. You see it's shrinking, 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 but in some of them, it begins after 1950, if you can see there, begins to stabilize and even to increase relative to incomes in the OECD economies, more strikingly than anywhere else, where? In China, down at the bottom, you probably can't see my cursor moving up there, but that's that one. And if you see something, the opposite happening, there's this dark, thank you very much. And then there's this dark line where there's a sharp decline. Where's that? 
Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, which is a very, which actually very interesting if you look from kind of the um, early 20th century, had gradually been increasing its income relative to that of the OECD until the 70s when it declined very, very dramatically. So it looks like the great divergence continues. It persists for a long time, except to some extent in India, to a significant extent in China and um, part, other parts of East, in some sense, Southeast Asia, that begins to be this catching up. But what else? What, what else can we say on the next slide, Nico? So we break that down into South Asia, East, the Tigers, so on, and we see what's really going on there uh, in a little bit more clarity, that post-1970 particularly, rising incomes per capita relative to those of the OECD countries. That is your catching up. That is the, the Asian mix, the newly industrializing countries. And then more recently, it's China. But what else where in the, in the, in the world? Next one. We see there's a number of countries getting stuck. They're not going through the same process of catching up, um, whether it's in the former Soviet Union or it's in Latin America, or starting with very, very low incomes per capita relative to those in the OECD country, but getting further and further behind. It's this overly aggregated, but nonetheless um, useful uh, category here of, of, of African economies. So that's the problem that we're trying to explain. Can you see the next one? I can't remember what's in the next slide. Okay, let's just go back a second for that. We can, we can leave it there. So that's the issue that we want to make sense of. How is it that some countries have managed to claw back and have become, you know, like South Korea has become an OECD economy? How is it that some countries have managed to do that in the period since the end of the Second World War, whereas others haven't managed to, or who have managed to rather less rapidly, less deeply, less successfully? Huge, huge questions. Um, and it's worth turning a little bit to long run economic history to see how ideas persist about answers to that question, but also answers to why the industrialization, the industrial revolution happened in the first place, what the source of that great divergence was, and how the arguments and the answers slightly shift more recently. So let's, let's in fact go to the next one, Nicola. And I want to. Um, really just use this to, to show the kind of long run um, persistence of differences in approach. So on the left hand side, you have a set of ideas and arguments, and they are largely, probably globally the most influential. And in terms of learning, they say, well, look, you know, we know the story. It's always been one way and it always will be. And all you need to do is repeat the recipe and you'll get it right. That's one important thing. The content of that largely is that markets are the optimal social institution for promoting, stimulating economic growth and poverty reduction and development. And if you let markets do their job, things will happen. It may be a bit gradual, but it'll happen. There's a very famous saying it was the, um, the epitaph to Alfred Marshall's um, principles of, of political economy in the early 20th century, which was this Latin phrase, natura non facet saltum. What that means is nature doesn't take big leaps. He got that from thinking about Darwin and, and, and evolution and so on. And the idea is there's always a process of incremental change and evolution through markets interacting and responding to flexible um, price signals and so on and so forth. So one very important idea that's always promoted in one form or another in that tradition is the idea of laissez-faire economics. Don't intervene in trade or in domestic markets um, beyond the absolute minimum. Let prices change to reflect relative scarcities and abundances. And in trade, it's Ricardo's old idea of, of specialization in line with your comparative advantage. 
You may not get instant results from that, but it will bring about the, the, the least distortive, distortionary and the most uh, optimal results if you just let it, let it do its job. And that's very much the, the core common historical idea about how the Industrial Revolution happened in the first place. So we can have in our minds this idea, let's just for simplicity say England versus China. And you can say, well, China was Asian despotism. This is a, a, a huge cliche of, of economic history. It's a cliche that Marx believed and fell for uh, amongst many other people. And on the other hand, England was this sort of Adam Smith paradise of competition, um, uh, a, a polite, minimal um, state that didn't intervene too much. And we had lovely um, in inclusive institutions and, and private property rights. And, and that allowed markets to, um, uh, to find their way and generate the change that became known as the Industrial Revolution. And I don't know why I've got the Cold War there. Oh, there's a long story I'm not going to tell, but if you, Eric Reinert tells a very brilliant story about comparative advantage as actually a kind of political idea. He said, you know, many people weren't that interested in Ricardo until the Cold War. And you can do these things called, what are they called? Google n-grams, I think. And you can see how many times a phrase or a concept or a word is used in, in publications. Um, in any given year internationally. And you see this incredible rise in reference to comparative advantage and David Ricardo through the Cold War and after the end of the Cold War, you see it um, declining very strikingly, which is a curious thing. So, but after the Cold War, what we got was the key idea of ideas within the Washington consensus that you should deregulate economies liberalize them from government control uh, and you should privatize as well and that went in some cases very very hard um, that line was pushed and a lot of very very sophisticated different things have happened since the heyday of the Washington consensus and in response to the the fairly obvious challenges um, to the validity of, of the ideas promoted there but it hasn't gone away and I would say just very briefly, the two ways, I hope we discuss these more throughout the rest of the next couple of weeks, but there are two particular variants in which the same ideas hold nowadays in, in consultancy reports for governments, in World Bank advice and so on and so forth. And one of those is to say, well, look, we, the, the way trade happens nowadays is really through global value chains and it's shown in the rise and share of trade accounted for globally by by trade in intermediate goods and so on so it's all about where a country's production structure is located within specific value chains whether it's value chains for cars or for um, computers or even for coffee or whatever it may be and if you're somebody like david dollar you argue this is true, it's important, but the way to upgrade within global value chains is to specialize in what you have a comparative advantage for. Don't try and push your luck, is what they're really saying. Don't intervene in the market. Don't try and accelerate things beyond these, this incrementalism of natura non facet sultan. So that's the same idea that's been there for, for a very, very long time. A much more interesting version of this, I think, is in uh, the work of, um, uh, who is it? It's, it's Hausmann and Hidalgo and people in Harvard at the, uh, responsible for the Atlas of Economic Complexity. And their argument, um, to put it very, very crudely, is that you, you should try and specialize in the things which are closest to you in terms of proximity and to, to what you do already. In other words, they mobilize the same kinds of capability and skills and resources that you already have. So you do need to try and shift resources um, into slightly different activities. You need some sort of government policy to encourage that, but you have to specialize in things that are just the next stage along. They're not big leaps to distant 
economic activities, but they're, they're based on this idea of proximity. It's very beguiling, it's very, very interesting. It is, in a way, I think, nothing other than the latest version of comparative advantage. So that's one tradition. And you have, on the other hand, a very different tradition, which says, well, actually, the history is all wrong. That story about despotic Asia and China and um, an Adam Smithian paradise in England, it's wrong. And, and the new economic history will tell us that actually, if anything, the closest place to the dreams of Adam Smith was China in the Qing dynasty, where you had a state that was a very, very paternal and conservative state that intervened to an extent, but only to try and keep things as they were. And it was a largely agrarian society and so on. Whereas by contrast, England, had this warmongering fiscal military state. So it was very inefficient, its bureaucracy in many ways compared to China, except for the fiscal bureaucracy. What Eng the English state was good at on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, when it was fighting, by the way, a world war that had the same kind of economic impact on the British economy as did the Second World War, what the state was good at, wasn't very good at many things, but what it was good at was raising taxes and paying off debts. Why did it do all of that? Because it had to finance its war machine. And it didn't only have to finance it, it had to produce for this war machine, which was a, at the core, a naval war machine. So it had to organize the supply of timber and of, um, uh, things to kind of supply and, and, and feed the Navy and so on and so forth. So it was effectively a developmental state organized around military might globally. So it was the opposite of a laissez-faire economy. After the Industrial Revolution, in the late sort of 19th century, second half of the 19th century, it did become much more of a free trade laissez-faire economy, but it wasn't before the Industrial Revolution. That's a dramatic upside down version of what many people inherit from textbooks on economics and economic theory and history. So in a way, that way of telling the historical story has a lot in common with a different tradition in development economics, which emphasizes the historical significance in all forms of economic development, not just England's industrial revolution, but all the catching up that happened afterwards, the role of states and the role particularly of protectionism in trade and states guiding economic activities in order to try and promote that catching up. So that includes um, very famously uh, people like Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton said of Adam Smith something I'm paraphrasing, but he said, Adam Smith's theory is really, really beautiful. It's geometrically correct, but it's pragmatically wrong. It doesn't work in the real world. You know, it's beautiful on paper, but in the real world, that's not how things work. And, um, and Alexander Hamilton responsible for, for American protectionism, uh, allowing for helping promote early industrialization there and catching up with the British economy. So, um, Let's skip to more recent stories and versions of a different tradition. As many people in this different tradition feel that what they've argued for a long time, which is the importance of industrial policy and states intervening to promote catching up economic development has to some extent been vindicated. And you see that because around the world, um, nowadays, it didn't used to be like this, Nowadays, everybody and their aunt and uncle believes in industrial policy. Almost, not quite, but, but I'm not sure David Dollar does, but, 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 but many people do, many people, sort of mainstream economists who in the past would have rubbished industrial policy now do see, see the kind of point of it in a way. The contrast here with, with global value chains is people would say, Dollar is wrong, you can't just rely on um, getting better and better slowly with what you specialize in and your, your, your given location in the queue in the global value chain. But there are things that you can do 
so that if you don't do anything, you're Mexico and you you insert yourself into a global value chain for, I don't know, tech, tech IT stuff, so on and so forth, electronics, but all you get is a little enclave. You get no linkages to domestic value added. Um, and, and the contrast with, with that would be in South Korea or in China more recently. Nicolau will talk more about China a bit, bit later. In South Korea, for example, you had this interesting experience of what, what Kun Lee, I think, and, um, calls in-out-in global value chain industrialization. So they inserted themselves into the car, um, the auto industry value chain uh without with a huge proportion of that being foreign value added but then they removed themselves from the global value chain in order to behind protective barriers develop their own auto industry with the hyundai pony car which was all the taxis in south korea in the 70s and so on and so forth and then when they developed the capabilities they reinserted in the global auto industry at much higher levels of domestic value added and technology and so on and so forth so these traditions run contrary to one another, right from what one thinks helps explain the Industrial Revolution to what one thinks now should be the appropriate policies for uh, managing integration into global value chains and so on. Nicola, on we go. Um, so I, what I'm going to try to do is, is characterize, in a sense, the left hand uh, part of that previous slide briefly and then we're I think we're probably going to try and pause for a while have some discussion and then Nicola will pick up afterwards so if we want to remind ourselves you all know this but just to remind ourselves what lies at the heart of that um, that influential mainstream neoclassical approach to economics economic development and industrial policy it has the following features the importance of getting prices right. That really means letting the market decide what the price is that can clear, uh, clear a market and equilibrate supply and demand. The, the long run feeling amongst many neoclassical economists that you don't really need to think that much about sectors because there's nothing special about manufacturing vis-a-vis -vis services or agriculture and so on and so forth. Why not? Because all economic activities are subject to diminishing returns and maybe constant returns to scale, etc. Third, there is an emphasis on following your current comparative advantage. What is it that you can produce least ineffectively uh, relative to other countries. That's what you should specialize in and then you'll become uh, even more effective at it. And then gradually over time, you'll develop the capabilities that shift your comparative advantage. But you should follow that. You shouldn't try and push it. There's a, a softer version, which is to say that governments sometimes do have to intervene, but they should limit, this is quite a sophisticated thing in a way, that they should limit their interventions to the level of their current capabilities, their current administrative capacities. In other words, we may look backwards and say, oh, well, yes, the Korean state intervened and so on and so forth. But in Ghana or Nigeria um, or, 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 um, or Angola, that you should only intervene up to what your current capabilities tell you you can do exactly how you define that is a, a little bit dodgy and it's probably very bad history as well um pushing on a little bit beyond that there's the argument no no back we go that you should the, what's necessary for economic development is savings because out of savings people invest well how do you raise savings levels well in order to do that goes this line you have to liberalize financial markets. So I think we've got at least one Ethiopian person here, as you know, there's very strong state intervention in, in financial markets uh, in Ethiopia. And there's a lot of pressure from uh, the World Bank and the IMF, probably the British government too. There's a lot of pressure from 
uh, within Ethiopia and from diaspora Ethiopians to say, please, let's just accelerate liberalization of financial markets and the banking sector, because that way, interest rates and prices will find their way to generate savings. Without that, we're repressing uh, finance. We're repressing the scope for people to save, the incentives to save, and then we won't have any resources that are investable. So there's no wonder we can't generate any growth over the long run. And then finally, when we're, if we're worried, as for example, South Africans have to be unbelievably worried about unemployment, we need to realize, goes this story, that unemployment is a labor market uh, phenomenon. That's where it's determined. Unemployment doesn't, isn't driven by, determined by factors outside the labor market, it's largely determined within the labor market. So then we have to focus on the distortions that cause unemployment, and we have to make the labor market more flexible. So goes the story. Okay, next one, Nicola. Uh, and at a deeper level behind all of this is something methodological we need to think about. This is the, 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 the creature, homo economicus, economic man, person, whatever, who has certain kind of biographical features. So uh, economic person, let's say, homo economicus, essentially is a, a rational creature that makes choices, ordinary rankable choices, given available information, chooses among alternatives and makes the rational choice again and again and again. And they make them in order to pursue and maximize their individual uh, utility. So Homo economicus, that's you and me guys, is a selfish creature, a very selfish and rationally selfish individual. If your economics starts with that, as neoclassical economics does, it becomes an utterly classless way of thinking about um, political economy and economics. It's rooted in methodological individualism. The individual, that individual, Homo economicus, is the unit of analysis and the only one that really counts. And you then use that as the micro foundation, the behavior of interacting uh, selfish individuals. And then you build up. So you have these micro foundations, you build up, until finally you, you aggregate all of that into what you observe in, in, in macroeconomic balances and relationships and so on. And there's a curious ideological twist that comes with this, which is this idea, I don't know if any of you know about this, um, uh, Julia I saw, who lives in Austria, she will know maybe next door in Germany what the Swabian housewife is. It's got equivalents in, in, in England as well. But this is, goes back to a quote by Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, after the, or in the midst of the financial crisis in, in, in the late 2000s. And she, Angela Merkel was asked about the collapse of Lehman Brothers and, and other US banks and stuff. And she said, well, it's not really a, a mystery. Um, you just needed to ask the Swabian housewife, which is this ideological construct in German society of this, uh, the careful person who looks after the family finances and makes sure that um, people don't over borrow and so on and so forth. Why am I talking about this? Because her idea, what Angela Merkel was doing, which is a, uh, a trope of all neoclassical and neoliberal economic policy making, same with um, uh, George Osborne and people in, in, in the UK after, the, after that crisis, was saying that an economy, a macro economy, is the same as a little household in Southwest Germany or wherever. And the way in which households look after their money, which is ideally they're very, very sensible, they don't live beyond their means and so on, even though many of them do, that's how you should look after an economy. So if you're the chancellor, the finance minister, you should think like an individual household. That's a very, very powerful ideological tradition. Nicola, have I got more or was I gonna pause there? Oh, I do want to just very, very briefly, very quickly say that, you know, I'm, I'm highlighting something here, but there are different versions of it. 
And it's important to be aware of that. So on the one hand, you do get a kind of hard line that says um, this really is the case and there's only one way to do this. And, and we'll see if you see, show me the next slide um, in international trade. Can you click it again? Is it not going to show the text? Yes. Um, so you, I've got my nice. So this is neoclassical economists singing along as though they're part of a North Korean parade where you're not allowed to have the slightest variation from the line. Uh, and this is Jagdish Bhagwati, for example, saying freer trade is associated with higher growth and higher growth is linked to reduced poverty. Therefore, growth reduces poverty. End of story. Automatically. Very, very powerful statement. You get Saxon Warner in the mid 90s saying we find no cases to support the frequent worry that a country might open and yet fail to grow. Interesting. Let's go back a bit. That's the hard line. There's really no room for, for, for maneuver there. But there is a softer version. And the softer version arguably emerged particularly in the wake of the failure of the Washington Consensus, the challenges to it. And it comes partly with people like, uh, like Joseph Stiglitz and his information asymmetric approach to economic theory. And this line, which is rooted in the same precepts and axioms of neoclassical economics says, yeah, but what we do have to understand that markets, although they're wonderful social institutions, they're not always perfect. There are many, and in fact, there are more than we'd realized before, market imperfections and failures. And that's why we need states. We need states to intervene, to correct for imperfection and failure. So if there's a problem with asymmetric information, what the state should do is create an institution that, um, that balances out, means that everybody's got roughly equal access to information. And then you close out the, the imperfection in markets caused by information asymmetries. So when you privatize, that's great, but you have to try and privatize with institutionalization that mimics a competitive market through regulation of monopolies and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is about correcting for market failures. And industrial, in industrial policy, the version of this softer version of, of, of mainstream economics is to say, yes, you need a modest amount of industrial policy, but what it involves, and the most famous advocate of this is uh, the Chinese economist Justin Lin, is you need a facilitative state, a state that intervenes, but not very much. It means that it gets things right so that you score well on the World Bank's doing business index, for example. You, you encourage investments, but you don't, again, try to make big leaps. You don't go much further. Nicolau, hop, hop past the Korean parade, North Korean parade, and I think past that as well. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'm going to... I'm going to stop there. You can see these slides later. You'll have them all. There's another side to this, which is a methodological side, the way in which many people, even within largely the mainstream, think that economic theory has become increasingly detached from, uh, from the reality that it's supposed to make sense of. Is there anything else, Nicola, after this? I want to, I want to get to a pause. Um, yes, there is. Again, I'm going to kind of leave this. I think if we run through these, when we look at the historical record, what we tend to find, no, I'm go, I do want to do this. Okay, push on with the clicking. Thank you. What we find, okay, go, uh, yeah, we can, we can go here, is that um, there has been catching up and there's also been poverty reduction. But when we look at the reality, the record, and we see where the poverty reduction has been fastest, most dramatic, there's a strong case that actually it's happened where people have ignored or violated the principles of economic orthodoxy. And even within Africa, if we go to the, the next slide, we'll see that um, there have been extraordinary successes uh, in recent years, decades, in headcount poverty reduction in some countries, but again, and, and let's say the most striking of those countries is Ethiopia. But there again, what's happened is that that was during 
an administration that violated the principles of orthodoxy, that ignored um, the orthodox advice it was given. And if you look at countries which have been quite seduced by economic orthodoxy, such as, for example, Mozambique, such as arguably South Africa, the poverty reduction story are rather different. South Africa's is very, very mixed and, 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 and needs a lot more time. So we'll have another session on that, I, I think or hope. Nicola, let's see the, the overall global poverty picture. Next slide. Uh, you, you, you can see it there. You see that the, the most dramatic decline in East Asia and to some extent in, in South Asia too, that's in headcount poverty. And you look at the way in which in Sub-Saharan Africa, in terms of the number of people living in extreme poverty, uh, that number has gone up. Next slide. It's a bit of a poser to us. This is talking about something similar in a different way, which is the percentage of a population living below $1.25 a day. And if you look at um, A and B, you see these very dramatic declines in the share of the population living in extreme poverty. If you take Sub-Saharan Africa, quite a high proportion uh, living below the poverty line and it rises and then it falls, but it's still very, very high um, in some other parts of the world. So for example, Latin America and the Caribbean, it's a, a fairly low proportion compared to what was the case in South Asia, East Asia, Africa, but it hasn't really changed that dramatically. Next one. And if you look at the policy background to some of this, you see, well, since 1980, uh, many countries in Latin America did adopt neoliberal economic policies based on the presets we've been talking about. They largely abandoned industrial policy. What happened? We think about that kind of North Korean parade and the quotes from Baguati uh, and the quotes from Sachs and Warner. What happened in Latin America? In fact, well, from 1990 to 2008, GDP growth was very, very slow compared to the earlier post-World War II period. Very, very, and the same in terms of growth performance per worker as well, productivity, very, very low compared to that earlier period. So we need to, to question these orthodoxies. Nicola, I think there are one or two more, but I'm going to stop. And what I'd like to do now um, is, Rosal, with your help, if we can put people into their groups for something like kind of eight, nine minutes. Um, you're, you're welcome to discuss all of that, but I have a particular question to get you into the next part of our presentation that Nicola will lead. And the question I want you all to think about is how you would define structural change, okay? You're welcome to, to come up with any other reflections, but we're hoping to leave more time towards the end as well for, for that. So I want people to talk amongst themselves in their groups that Rosal will put you in for, um, yeah, let's say eight minutes right now, maximum. So, um, yeah, just building up on, on, on what, what Chris was talking about, it's, it is striking and it is indeed one of, the, one of the reasons why this program exists and why it's so great after 14 years to see it still going strong. Um, it's very, very clear that there's a major disconnect between what we observe as the reality of a number of countries managing to catch up and to grow rapidly, the kind of strategies they use, and on the other hand, the outcome of the strategies uh, advocated by, uh, by the mainstream development economics um, schools. And, and that contrast, I think, is, is best illustrated here, for example, in, in this slide, with, with the uneasiness to deal with, with certain countries which are so clearly uh, flying in the face of, of what they should be doing and so clearly performing better than, than they should be. I mean, one, one of the most striking, even more than Ethiopia examples, of course, is, is China, about which the scholarship has been really limited for a long time coming from the mainstream, partly because it was very difficult to reconcile what China was doing with any form or shape of, of mainstream policy prescriptions, although some people did try to do that about China and, and East Asia. What I want to shift to now is, I think, really what is the main um, lesson that we can get from, um, 
from the more critical, what was on the right side uh, of, of Chris's earlier slide on the consensus. Um, and, and that really fundamentally has to do with reconnecting with a tradition in economics um, that dates back at least five centuries. And that is very much a tradition preoccupied with a simple question, which is the question of development understood as how does one territory catch up with another territory that is more advanced. One of the earliest formulations of that was done by an Italian economist, Antonio Serra, uh, in the 1500s. And he was from Naples. Naples in the, is in the south of Italy, and Naples was, for all, you know, by all Italians, seen as a rich city because Naples had a very rich agricultural hinterland and a very, very rich agriculture. And this Neapolitan economist traveled to Venice, which according to the wisdom of the time, which was of course uh, very strong, which linked wealth to agriculture, should have been very poor. Venice indeed, if you've been there, is located in the middle of marshland. You can't really grow anything around Venice. And yet what he realized is that Venice was incredibly more sophisticated rich and complex um, uh, than, than Naples. And he asked himself the question, well, what, what is going on there, right? Why, why is there such a difference between, between these two places? And what he was touching was, I think, one of the fundamental insights of what you could call production-focused economics. It's the idea that different types of economic activities are subject to different return to scales. Um, and I think there's no better way to illustrate it than with this very simple, but at the same time, I think very complex graph, right? Um, let's start from the very first curve, right? The decreasing returns to scale curve. What you can see here is that the, the, the scale, uh, the curve starts going above the constant returns to scale. So a constant returns to scale would be quite simply put, if you increase um, the um, inputs by one, you will get a concomitant increase in output. If you increase, if you add uh, 10 workers, you will get a concomitant, uh, a proportional increase in, in output. Some sectors exhibit empirically decreasing returns to scale. But decreasing returns to scale doesn't mean that they're immediately low. And that's really interesting to observe. It means that initially those sectors will have greater than constant returns to scale, right? You can see, I don't know if you can see my, arrow going at the beginning it's a bonanza right and then after a while those returns get lower and lower and become actually less than the constant returns to scale right now typically sectors like this are natural resource sectors right mining is a i think a very good example think about mining you start off you find hopefully a very wealthy mining resource you start mining and you start basically digging and organizing the, the extraction process. After a while, the South Africans and others will know well, the resources, the, the, the minerals will find themselves so deep that you cannot mine in an open pit mine. You, start, you need to start digging underground. So you need to start building tunnels to bring workers down, to bring fresh air down, and of course, to extract the minerals. The deeper you go, and, and as we know, it can go to thousands of meters underground, the more complex, uh, the more costly, and the least returns you get. The same would apply, of course, to agriculture, right? In the beginning, if you start using fertilizers and technology, you can have enormous returns to scale uh, on, on agriculture when you modernize it. But after a while, those returns were flattened down because you exhaust uh, the natural resource, the land. Now, this is why a number of economists have emphasized the fact that, yes, it can seem logical to go for sectors that are easily available if you have natural resources. But one danger is that if you invest all of your efforts into such sectors, you're likely at some point to pay, um, to pay a very high price, which is that your returns will start declining. And so it's not necessarily, these are not necessarily developmental sectors if by development, you mean sustaining growth for a long time, which as, as we've discussed is, is fundamentally what development is about. What's interesting, and, and I think uh, most crucial for, for what we're dealing with, and I think what you're gonna be dealing with for much of this program is the shape of the increasing returns to scale curve. 
What's interesting is that before you reap increasing returns, which become higher than constant returns here, there is actually, unlike with the decreasing returns, which you could call the easy sectors or initially easy sectors, the curve finds itself below the constant returns scale. Now, what does this mean? It means that in the beginning, you're not doing very well. You're not doing very well. You're actually quite unproductive, quite inefficient. You're fiddling, right? It's only if you persist in time that you're likely to get increasingly good returns, which could actually become exponentially uh, uh, increasing. Typically and empirically, um, sectors which exhibit increasing returns to scale are linked to the manufacturing sector. What this means is absolutely fundamental for questions of development policy. What this means is that if you want to go into sectors that are likely to pull along your economic growth in the long term, you need to be ready to bear the costs of an initial phase of learning. You need to be ready to, to support a phase where you will be less productive. Imagine you start manufacturing cars. Chris was giving the example of, of the Korean car industry. You start, and after a few years, you find yourself there along the curve. But of course, if you go out on the open market, you're competing with producers who are here, here, or somewhere way above uh, where the computer screen ends. So of course, if you take a static approach to comparative advantage and say, well, let's see how Korean cars in 1980 are doing compared to Japanese cars and, uh, and American cars, the static analysis will be, well, they are less good, less reliable, more costly, no point in doing cars in Korea, right? Throw it away. And yet, what we know is that the cars that are made by the forerunner countries, whether it's the US, Germany, or others, have themselves gone through such a process of learning, right? And this part of the curve, I would argue, is the fundamental moment of economic development. Many people have argued that if we want to understand industrial policy at its heart as an instrument to promote development, industrial policy is all about managing this phase, this learning phase. It's about creating an environment and fostering relationships with the firms that are engaged in this process of incremental learning to protect them, but also to coerce them to make the required investment to learn. Mushtaq Khan has called this managing the rents associated with learning. Now, what is, I think that there's good news and bad news contained in, in, in this, uh, in this analysis. The good news is this latecomer advantage. It lies there. It is possible to shorten the learning curve compared to the forerunners because we can learn from their mistakes. We can learn from their own learning curve, right? It doesn't mean that the learning curve is necessarily going to be short, right? If you want to manufacture something extremely complex, it's obvious that you're going to need a very long time to learn to do it. But that time is likely to be much less long than what it took the earlier manufacturers to develop it. The bad news, however, is that this process of learning here is, sorry, is extremely difficult to manage politically, right? I, I was uh, really interested in, the, in what several of you said in the, in the discussion about the fact that yes, there are many uh, uh, industrial development or, or industrial policy promoting plans in a number of African countries, but very often they suffer from what you could call implementation-itis, right? A poor implementation. Um, and the response to poor implementation usually, I don't know if you would agree with me on this, is to come up with a new plan altogether and forget about what's been done before and say, well, this is the new plan, this is the new strategy. You know, maybe a minister has read about a new idea coming from this or that university, and that's going to be the focus now. And indeed, if you look at this curve and you think about what it would take to support firms in a particular sector to become competitive in what is indeed a, a very competitive world, you can see that this rapid change in plans is actually contradictory to the kind of policy coherence and single-mindedness that would be required to succeed in this. So, there's both good news and bad news. And I think, you know, as someone who, who, who has been following, of course, with, you know, very closely this Apple program for since its inception, I'm, I'm 
you know, I'm very excited by, by what some of you said, which I think is true, which is what, what we were saying 15 years ago was rather marginal. Now it's become a lot more broadly accepted. And I think it's, it's great, you know, to feel that uh, discussions of industrial policy in universities and governments are, are now much more mainstream, if you want. The problem, uh, as some of you have pointed at, is that the fact that they are more mainstream doesn't necessarily automatically translate in actual success. And I think what, what we face here is, is the very complexity of the simple curve, right? We understand, theoretically, that some sectors and some policies might lead to catch up, might lead to economic development, but actually implementing and succeeding is an incredibly complex process. A bit like Socrates, the Greek philosopher, was saying, the more I know, the more I realize I know very little. Because what is required to make those policies successful is incredibly complex. But now I want to focus a little bit on why supporting increasing returns to scale sectors is so fundamental. Um, First thing I want to say is that increasing returns to scale, if we accept them, and I think the empirical evidence is, is overwhelming, even though they are a priori dismissed by uh, much neoclassical economics. What they mean is that a static approach to comparative advantage cannot promote development. Let me spell this out. If you take a static approach to, uh, to comparative advantage, you say you should focus on what you are good at doing now. It is very likely that as a developing country, you're gonna be somewhere here, perhaps there, if you've already started a while ago, somewhere there. But you're very unlikely to be in most, at least non-super simple sectors, very advanced in your return to scale curve. What this means is that you should actually focus, if you follow that, on sectors that already have high returns to scale, which are typically going to be decreasing returns to scale. Now, if you take a static approach, that makes sense. But what we're seeing here is that economic history has a very simple but powerful lesson, which is that our comparative advantage are the result of an accumulation of investment, of knowledge, of effort, of policies. They are not static by definition, right? Um, and examples, we'll come back to some of these, are bound to show us that they're not static. So, by promoting a static approach to comparative advantage, what we have to face is that much economic theory is actually giving advice that goes against the, uh, the likelihood of, of development or that makes development more difficult. Now, what are increasing returns to scale effectively? Increasing returns to scale are increased productivity at constant technology level. And in order to understand how they take place, well, we need to understand how firms operate. We need a, a lot of very ingrained and fine-tuned analysis of cases to see where this has taken place. And what, what research shows us is that they typically happen within firms, right? Um, they happen through, or they flow from intimate connections between firms, collective, so-called collective efficiency, right? And that's why, as some of you were pointing to, they typically blossom in regions um, such as the Great Boston region, Northern Italy, the Sinot Valley in Brazil, areas where firms can learn from one another, right? And of course, share an increasingly trained pool uh, of workers. Now, examples of, of learning by doing um, as, you know, as, uh, as, a, as what is really behind uh, development or development in action, I think, can emerge from a range of examples which Today seem obvious to us, but if we look back at history, nobody would have thought this was possible. Go to the 1950s and ask any American engineer or French engineer, do you think Brazil will ever be able to make commercial passenger jets? They would have laughed in your face, right? And yet today Embraer, which is a project developed by the Brazilian military, is the largest manufacturer of small passenger jets. Most likely you've flown on one if you've flown uh, on a plane that contains more than fewer than 100 people. Who would have thought 30 years ago that Ethiopia was in the process of becoming a giant in the manufacturing of clothing, including for top brands? Absolutely no one. In the 1960s, when South Korea sought to get a loan to develop its shipbuilding industry, it was told off. We were basically told ships are very complex things to manufacture. There's no chance such a poor country, an underdeveloped country, will ever manage to do it. 
Yet today, there were leaders in chip manufacturing. Indian cars, same thing, just go 20 years back. And people laughed at Indian cars, assumed that they would always be highly unreliable. And yet today, they're becoming one of the fastest sellers, certainly in, in middle-income countries, and have become highly reliable. One more example, which I think is, is an example of how learning by doing isn't just about catching up, but I think it's also very much now something which probably makes a lot of people in the West uncomfortable, it's about getting ahead, is how do we regulate the mighty digital economy, right? These enormous firms that control the new gold that is data. Well, the, this is a, a picture that uh, I think very interestingly uh, was made the cover, if you've seen it, of The Economist uh, a week ago. And, and the title was China's Attack on Tech. Now, if you look at this picture, you're thinking, OK, here is heavy handed state regulation crushing uh, private entrepreneurship. But when you read the article and you read about the matter, what you find is something altogether different and I think really fascinating, which is and which I think is <clears throat> perhaps the biggest source of hope, if we think about it. It is that this learning curve clearly isn't just a learning curve that happens within manufacturing or within the economy. There's also very much an increasing return to scale learning curve when it comes to policymaking. If you manage to pursue policies, to learn from your mistakes, to try and improve them without always shifting from one piece of advice to the next, you can actually develop very advanced policy capabilities. Currently, China, having incubated the world's biggest and most dynamic, much more than the US uh, today, Alibaba and other uh, Chinese firms are, are bigger than their US counterparts, digital sector is actually engaging actively in a mammoth task, which is the task of trying to regulate it. What does regulated mean? Trying to limit the power of monopolies and prevent them from crushing emerging firms trying to protect the rights of workers who work in the digital economy, trying to protect consumers and, and individuals uh, from the unilateral control of data by firms, and so on and so forth. The Economist explains this, but bemoans, and I think it's, it's really typical, right, of, of a kind of mentality of focusing on things as they are without seeing the process of transformation. What The Economist bemoans is the fact that China is at the moment ill-equipped to do this. They say, well, their um, unit in the Chinese government uh, that deals with regulating these companies only has about 40 people. Undoubtedly, this is too little. Undoubtedly, what the Chinese are in the process of doing is to learn how to regulate these very, very strong companies. And what I find striking is that the Chinese are the only ones in the world who are effectively doing this. No one else uh, is effectively really trying to regulate this partly because of the hesitancy of the Americans about it, and partly because they lack the ability to act together to do it. So in many ways, the kind of learning curve that we're dealing with here is not just a, a learning curve that can be linked to individual sectors, but also to the capacity to develop the policy capacity within the state. Now, we've talked about structural change, and I think what you said is, was, was spot on. So let me just leap very quickly over over that to focus on what I think are, are some, some fundamental issues, right? Why is it that the manufacturing sector seems to be associated with, uh, with, with faster rates of growth? It seems to be the sector that typically leads economic growth um, uh, in the process of development. The first thing which we've, we've talked about is learning by doing, right? And that's is something that is very much associated with industry because in the very controlled environment where manufacturing takes place, there are routines of, especially related to the use of machinery that develop and that make it possible to have very rapid increases in productivity. One example that I think is, is, is perhaps useful there to illustrate this is Industrial machinery is not quite the same as the machines that you buy for individual consumption. Industrial machinery are extremely complex to operate. So even if you buy an industrial machine, it will take months, sometimes years, to use it to its full capacity, right? And this process of learning by doing is not a process that happens by 
being taught. It's a process that happens through trial and error. And this is why the need for protection for incubating those progresses is so important. But there are other benefits related to the manufacturing sector too, such as technological change, right? Think of how many of the progress in the services sector actually comes from the spillover from the use of manufacturing products. The most important one is the one that you're all talking to or looking at in this moment, of course, which is your personal computer, but there's many others, right? Um, typically also manufacturing promotes linkages between sector, right? If, we, if you look at the growth of productivity in agriculture, very often you'll find it is related to greater use of machinery or greater use of fertilizers, which are, as you know, mostly industrial products. And finally, the manufacturing sector can offer an enormous advantage, which other sectors can too, uh, which is to relieve balance of payment constraints. Balance of payment constraints remain to this day one of the biggest obstacles for any developing economy. Imagine an economy that is rapidly growing thanks to the natural resources sector. Using the resources that, uh, or the, the money that it's generating, it leverages this money and takes loans in order to invest in infrastructure. This infrastructure in turn requires buying huge amounts of capital equipment from outside in order to build roads, highways, uh, housing, and a range of other things. Typically, these imports of imported capital equipment are at some point going to cause a balance of payment constraint, which will make it difficult to continue with investment. This is why much of the, uh, of the historical uh, wisdom on, on industrialization has been focusing on the idea of import substitution industrialization. What is impulse substitution industrialization? It's not simply saying, let's substitute uh, consumer goods. Of course, it's, it's a part of that. Let's substitute consumer goods we can produce in order to uh, ring fence resources to import uh, capital equipment. But it's also, let's then move on to substituting this capital equipment to limit this balance of payment constraint. So the range of reasons which explain why, why manufacturing plays a key role. Now, Caldor uh, famously uh, uh, proposed a series of growth flows that, that systematize this, right? Um, first growth flow that Caldor put forward was that there's a strong positive link between the growth of manufacturing and the growth of GDP. The second is that there's a strong positive causal relation between the growth of manufacturing output and the growth of productivity in manufacturing. That is nothing but the manifestation of the increasing returns to scale story that I started with. Why is this important? If I can pause here for a second from a policy point of view, and if I think of a number of African countries, one important lesson from this is that this learning process is slow and painful. If there is an industrial base, trying to safeguard it and build on it is absolutely crucial. Because if you allow an industrial base to be wiped out, for example, through careless liberalization, which is what happened to many countries in the 1980s and 90s, what you're effectively losing is much more than the simple nominal amount of contribution to your GDP. You're losing this accumulated experience. The third law is that there's a strong positive causal relation between the rate of growth of manufacturing and the growth of productivity outside manufacturing. Right? Um, and this is, again, something really important. When we talk about structural change, yes, we're talking about the reallocation of labor from relatively less productive to relatively more productive sectors. And we're talking really about the decline, the relative decline of agriculture as a share of total wealth. That does not mean, and I think that's uh, something that, that uh, we'll talk about again, it does not mean that agriculture doesn't have a role to play in structural change, right? It doesn't mean that agriculture should be ignored. Nobody is saying this, right? What it means is that typically it will employ fewer people and it will relatively decline compared to other more successful sector. But by relatively declining, it can also be growing really fast and playing a really important role. And I think that's particularly the case with a phenomenon which uh, which Chris actually has, has written extensively about, which is the fact that much 
of the um, of the ways in which a number of sectors have been transforming, like non non manufacturing sectors, is inspired by the way in which the manufacturing sector is organized. You have what what is sometimes referred to as an industrialization of freshness, right? In order to be able to provide fresh fruits and vegetables or flowers to consumer markets, what you really need to realize, because very often they come from very far, is that you've got a very industrial supply chain that's been organized from production to storage to distribution to make it possible for you to have fresh fruits, vegetable, flowers, or other things. Similarly, if you think about the services sector, right, and what some people refer to as a logistics revolution, which is it's nothing else than the industrialization, <coughs> excuse me, of how logistics are organized in order to make them so efficient, so rapid, so just in time, that location matters less in, uh, in supplying goods and services. So the lessons learned from the manufacturing sector have penetrated other areas and mean that it's possible to have structural change today, not just in, in manufacturing. Just to try and bring these, these insights together, um, and I think I'll, if it's okay with Baba, I'll maybe speak for another five minutes or so, and then maybe we can, we can uh, five or 10 minutes, and we can then have a, a discussion. Um, I think it's very useful, and I think that's, that's something we've been trying to emphasize through a call since the beginning, to think of development as a process of learning. And very much, if you remember Chris's two-part slide, the right-hand side of learning, the Sinatra way, your own way, right? Development is a process of learning first and foremost by workers who are the ones in factories or in farms who are implementing um, these, these more efficient work routines and gaining productivity. In fact, the very first or one of the very first industrial policies ever was a, a worker poaching policy by the British government about three or 400 years ago poaching skilled Dutch textile workers in order to get those workers to teach British workers how to use machinery, right? Fundamentally, it's become, with the growth of, of industrial capitalism, it's been a process of learning within firms, right? And of course, that process of learning, like all processes of learning, the forerunners, whether they're states or companies, systematically try to make it more difficult for those who follow them to simply follow in their footsteps, to benefit from, uh, from the latecomer advantages. I'll go back to this in a second. But also and fundamentally, it is a process of learning within states. And here, I think, I, I wanna bring it back, but thinking back about this, um, about the curve, you know, the increasing return to scale curve. When we are told that countries should be following policies that are, that correspond to their current levels of administrative capacity. What we're often being told is that they should have no ambition in developing such, such capacity. And yet, it's obvious for everyone to see that when China embarked on its industrialization drive, it didn't have anything near its current policy capacity. It built this capacity through an iterative and sometimes difficult process of failures and learning from failure um, over time. What characterizes those countries that indeed have succeeded, and this is why I was so interested in, in what some of you were saying in the group that I listened in on, was that they were able to persist, to pursue, to learn from their mistakes. And even though they interacted sometimes with outside advisors or consultants, not to simply take their words as, as the, new, you know, the new gospel and follow, whatever advice they were given, but use it selectively to try and adapt it to their own conditions. And of course, understanding your own conditions is sometimes much more difficult than making sense of an outside story, right? Because we're all immersed in our own country. Sometimes the problems may be right in front of us, but it's very difficult for us to see it. I mean, I, I, I think here, for example, of how in many ways people tend to see South Africa's Black Economic Empowerment Policy is being very successful, right? I mean, it is a policy that's been followed through, and yet it is clear for everyone to see that there's been almost no effort to link Black Economic Empowerment to production, to the kinds of sectors and activities that may have pulled ahead South African development. 
So making sense of these kinds of contradictions and trying to learn is a process, is an iterative process. It's a very complex process. And I think we can only start discussing it today, but hopefully through the course of the program, there'll be interesting discussions around this. Um, I think I've already covered this. This I will, if, if Chris agrees, uh, we can talk about, we, I've mentioned this already and I would like to go quickly to, to this actually. I mentioned this already, but I want to I want to go back to this. Industrialization, as I was saying, is increasingly not only about the urban factories. It's also a process affecting agriculture and rural areas and services. And so structural change can also happen within a particular sector. And I think a, a very powerful example of this uh, can be uh, the way in which Ethiopia emphasized the development of its flower industry and made it uh, turning it into a world leader. And this flower industry, uh, from all the accounts I've read about it, is, is very far from a traditional flower industry. It is very much an industrial uh, or, or an agro-industrial activity. Um, of course, the uh, field will never be a fully controlled environment in the way a factory is, but it's very close, very close to that. So economic transformation can be as much about raising yields and labor productivity and coffee production as it can be about new manufacturing. And I think that's, that's really important um, in the context, for example, of discussions about premature deindustrialization, which are going to be one of the important topics you'll discuss in a port, um, and the reduced scope, of course, for manufacturing to absorb labor as manufacturing becomes more and more uh, productive. So let me try in the next uh, few minutes to, to, to close this, uh, this presentation and hopefully launch uh, with you a, an interesting debate uh, by, by talking about where, what do we do with these insights? And what do we do, for example, with the insights that come from this alternative way of, of looking at economic development? First thing to say is this alternative way of looking at economic development is a way that I think is, is appealing to many of you for the reason that it comes from countries that have sought to catch up and not from countries that have sought to assert their dominance once they had leapt forward. The US and Alexander Hamilton that Chris was referring to in the, in the late 18th century is very much a country that is trying to avoid being crushed by British economic and political domination, right? It's, the problematic that, that Hamilton and the US are facing is how do we try and develop our own economy to not be a satellite and remain a, a semi-colony of, of the United Kingdom. And Alice Samson, who was certainly one of the greatest development economists who ever lived and who, uh, to our great pleasure, came to a port until the year of her death uh, in, in 2012, used to say jokingly to South African ministers, you know who would be a great teacher for you? Brazil learn from what they've done in Brazil, which doesn't mean copy and paste what the Brazilians have done, but try and understand how a country that shares some very similar structural features has managed to do relatively better, although not perfectly, out of that. Now, it's very clear, and I was alluding to it, there's a return of industrial policy to the fore of development debates, especially in Africa. And I think in many ways that is, that is positive. Um, but, and Chris emphasized this, I think, uh, very well, there's also a number of differences in what we mean with industrial policy. There is the soft industrial policy or the industrial policy accommodating uh, a more neoclassical approach, which is just creating conditions for industrial success through modest upgrading and global value chains, uh, attracting FDI you know, in new forms. Versus the idea of saying, well, you need to learn to make independent decisions and monitor capital. The challenge, of course, is that if we want to follow that latter line, there's an abundance of pessimism in the literature. And let me say up front, while I disagree with this pessimistic literature, I don't think that it is arguing things that come from another planet. So, for example, the so called neo patrimonial school which is a school coming from political science whose main line of argument is that corruption is so deeply ingrained, typically in many African countries, that any attempt at having 
industrial development or industrial policy is, will, is likely to be derailed. I very much disagree with this school. Um, and in fact, if you want to think critically about the arguments they make, I encourage you to look at perhaps one of Tandikam Kandawari's best papers on this, which uh, I'm happy to share a link to if you want in the chat. It's a long, a long review and, and critical reflection on these arguments. But as you'll see, these arguments are not entirely, you know, imagined. For anyone who in South Africa has been following the Zondo Commission, for example, it's true that you could feel rightfully a little bit discouraged thinking about what's happened, right? But there's also enormous pessimism, if, if we are serious about what it's telling us, coming from the analysis of global value chains. Because these analyses, what they typically do is they focus on the power structures within existing value chains. And they give us to see something which is very true, which is that the lead firms within these value chains have come up with a range of strategies that make it extremely difficult to insert yourself anywhere but at the very bottom of those value chains. I think that's become very clear I think, in the context of the COVID vaccine, right? Where, where there has been uh, some manufacturing, for example, in South Africa, it's very much followed the so-called Coca-Cola model. You know how Coca-Cola makes is made. No, it's Coca-Cola doesn't actually have factories. It makes this kind of mix and then it outsources to bottling firms, which are different firms. They mix that special ingredient, which is the most expensive thing in Coke. They mix it with water, with sugar, then they bottle it and then they sell it. But much of the actual value is, is contained in the so-called intellectual monopoly that Coca-Cola holds, right? And of course, Coca-Cola can hold this uh, because you cannot sell Coca-Cola if you don't have that agreement. And as the, the pharmaceutical industry basically is, is functioning in a very, very similar way. So even if you can hear about some vaccines being made here and there outside of the core countries, very often they're made using this, um, this finish and fill uh, mix and fill Coca-Cola model. Now that gives us plenty of reasons, I think, to be to be pessimistic, you know. But I would like to to to, to argue that, of course, you know, there's no question that the process of economic development is an arduous process. It's a very complex process, and it has complexities that we're trying to engage with, but that we cannot do full justice to, even in a very intense two-week course. I think the lesson that many people who are engaged in a pod, you know, in organizing it and teaching on it, who've been, uh, you know, uh, following it for years, is very much an idea which, which people like Chris have written eloquently about. I'm sure he'll talk more about it. Possibilism. Uh, Tandikam Kandawire certainly was was was, uh, and, and uh, Samson were, were fervent supporters. You know, Tandika talked about the need to run while others walk, which is a very beautiful metaphor of how you catch up. The idea is, yes, we learn from others' mistakes, from other successes, from our own mistakes and from our own successes. We'll try again, we fail again, but we fail better, right? Because that's the way, that's the only way to go forward, right? Um, and this ability, to, um, this ability to carry through uh, policies, I think is, is, is fundamentally perhaps the golden grail of, of economic development. One very interesting insight that comes from, from uh, perhaps one of the most uh, far-seeing, clear-seeing development economists who ever lived, Hirschman, was that what is scarce in low-income economies is not capital. It's not a middle class. It's not an entrepreneurial spirit or the right kinds of property rights and, and striving individualism. It is altogether more original. It is what he calls the capacity to problem solve in a capitalist world, the ability to make development decisions. Um, uncertainty is pervasive, mistakes are inevitable, but the ability to take swift decisions to reverse errors, to extricate the state from entanglement with entrenched lobbyists is rare. I mean, I, I cannot not mention what was for me a very enlightening lecture I gave at WITS uh, a few years ago, where we were talking about Hirschman. And um, one of the students was, uh, was working for a, a department dealing with industrial policy. And he said, well, this is actually really interesting because um, in my experience of five years working on industrial development, he said, 
I cannot remember a single case where we won an argument with the private sector lobbyists. Every time we try to regulate around something, every time we try to, um, to impose a, uh, a policy, so for example, a policy, how do we calculate? Just to give an example, right? Um, we'll give you funding if you have at least 50% local content to what you're manufacturing. Okay, how do you calculate local content? Well, there's many ways you can do it that really underestimates the local content. And of course, firms will propose mechanisms um, that, will, uh, that will do that in order to have as little constraint as possible. And his comment was, and he was quite delusional and the students were quite shocked was, I don't remember a single case where we could win an argument around any of these issues. And very sadly, when he was asked by his colleague, well, what, why, what's your explanation for it? His response was, well, you know, these consultants, they come and they have such great presentations, you know, they're just so compelling. And I think it goes back to something one of you was saying, which is indeed, they may not be in many cases, much of a drive, you know, it's, it's sometimes more about appearing to be doing something than it is to be than it is to do something. So how do we achieve you know, this? And I, I, as you have by now understood, I, I don't have in my pocket a magical recipe for, for economic development. Lessons from the past and the present are tricky to use. Policymakers tend to pick on detail, which is something I've seen many times. This or that policy sounds nice. Let's try and copy it. Avoiding the bigger picture because the bigger picture is often very uncomfortable. One thing that I think uh, Tandikam Kandawire like to insist on, and I think there is a lot to that, is that one of the key weaknesses in many parts of this continent is it's the intellectual dependency of many economists on aid donors. Now, Tandika's criticism and Kandawire's criticism of that didn't mean that he was saying we should reject all advice, you know all ideas coming from aid donors. It simply means that it is crucial to invest in building autonomous capacity. It is a crucial, certainly not necessary, if we knew what was necessary, we would tell you, but a crucial condition for development. And I hope that a program like Apport contributes to this. And to finish, I'd like just to ask a, a slightly provocative question, right? Promoting increasing returns to scale, promoting economic development is about coercing and inducing capitalists to go into sectors which will be developmental, where they will reap the benefits of these increasing returns to scale and putting effort into that. But what if the existing capitalists in a country are not inclined to become competitive, but rather to make easy profits? What if they are trying to maneuver, just make no mistake, although I don't, probably don't need to tell you that, what they will do, um, to try and maneuver government policy in such a way that they don't need to do anything fundamentally transformative, but that they can get huge profits out of it. Now, would in this case, an approach that is simply aimed at facilitating accumulation help development? I wonder if we can, perhaps, I, I don't know, Chris, if you want to add something, but I'm happy to, from my side, to leave it there and to hear your thoughts on that. Just to flag up one thing, which is that Nicola was talking about um, things such as the so-called industrialization of freshness. We have a session in our board devoted to that, so we'll probe that idea and where it comes from on Friday. But I'll stop there for now.